file and then take the remaining chunks and apply compression. We'll do that on the same okay. file. Okay, because there's like a remainder. A it's, like a divi yeah. it's like long division with a remainder. There's always unique data. Okay. But, okay. okay. So that's one of the things we'll do. I mean, we, we will support both inline and post-process and hybrid. So okay. we have a product right now, I won't tell you which one it is, that'll do dedupe inline, but then it'll do compression as a post-process. So dedupe can be engineered to run right. fast. Right. Compression, we would take more time, mm -hmm. and, okay. and so we'll let that run as a lazy background process. Okay. And do you um, have, then, then when you get the data on the other side, you got to rehydrate the data yeah. and. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And that's always. And that. Now there's there's takes, an asymmetry. That's wow. one of the things we figured takes, out is there's an asymmetry there, so that right. we would rather take more time to shrink the data mm -hmm. than to get in the way of a read operation. So we do everything we can for the rehydration of the data, or okay. the decompression, to be much faster than the compression itself. Hmm. Um, and it, it, it's partly because this this context-weighted algorithm okay. will be trying different things and kind of playing around with the algorithms to pick to get absolutely the best shrink rates, whereas yeah. once it's shrunk, you know, it's encoded with precisely which algorithm, and, and then the algorithms themselves tend to be a little asymmetric. Little so, one, but one, one of Callie's earlier points is that there's trade-offs, right? So, mm -hmm. in, in some of this stuff. So, like, if I was going to use deduplication and compression, and it was for purposes of sending stuff off-site, right, for disaster recovery, mm -hmm. right, application recovery, anything that elongates that period of the post-process expands the amount of data that could be lost in the event of a disaster, right? Yes. So, you, so you've, ex yes. you've expanded the, the, the right. your, your loss opportunity. Right. Your, your backup right? window has increased. So those increased. are some interesting, interesting there's a, yeah, there. There's, there's, there's lots of interesting trade-offs. Um, one of the things to consider, for example, is, is in a compliance-oriented archive like our DX product, you wouldn't want to dedupe files because dedupe takes a file, breaks it into chunks, and recombines them in all random ways. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas in a compliance oriented archive, they have a file, it gets treated with worm and retention and right. expiration policies, and they want to keep those as discrete files. I mean, that's, you know, there, so there, you there may to... be regulatory pressure. So we would, right. so our DX product, which is actually, and I'll say here, is the, is the first product we're going to ship with Ocarina technology included with it. Okay. And that's coming later this year, um, and months that will be months, not years. Yeah, <laughs> okay. depends how many months, I suppose. But oh, uh, you could calculate it in you, months. You can and right. still be years. So it's a miracle how, of math. How many hands do I have to count? <laughs> right. um, but that'll be a compression only uh, workflow. The the data sets you tend to see in because that kind of, of compliance of, issues. Well, partly because of compliance, but also the data sets you tend to see in that use case are unique data sets. Uh, so even in an e-discovery world, there are, there are uh, obviously there's redundancy and emails and attachments and all the things that are going through an e-discovery process, but generally the application layer that exists above the storage is already stripping out a lot of that redundancy. So we find that, that uh, there may not be a lot of incremental benefit to doing deduplication and that compression okay. is. So uh, there's, there's also, for example, the, the idea in certain workflows that you'll want to recover things on a file by file basis. Right. And so again, I don't want to scramble the chunks and put them in special containers. Yeah. I want to find a file in a file system yeah. and I want see to it and move it back. Right. I want to restore a specific. I may need to decompress it. Accidentally, but, but at least uh, it's exactly. But, but but at least it's a discrete file that a, a script or a piece of software can go access and pull back. Um, you know, so there's different scenarios for different products and platforms and use cases. And fortunately, when we started down the path of developing our embedded code. Um, uh, we build it in a modular way that will allow us to kind of, you know, not just do inline and post-process and so forth, but also, um, you know, some interesting ideas around how we throttle our resources, resource consumption, and make sure that we're not getting in the way of normal I.O. to the storage platform. Yeah. I know this is changing, okay? I know this is changing because of the investments and the acquisitions that Dell has made mm -hmm. and, and the investment they've made in channel partners, right? Mm -hmm. But there was a, at least a time when you, when, People even within Dell would say, if you got past the first bullet, you have too many bullets for our sales team to explain, right? <laughs> the, the solution. I mean, yeah. you know, this yeah. is just yeah. this is this was reality. It's like we're looking for velocity. We're not looking for long conversations. What you just described in your technology is, wow. There are a lot of there are a lot of trade-offs and decisions that you have to make along the way. 
So it's, it's to make the right decision, and you can't just leave it up to. I mean, clearly, clearly not. You, clearly you not. can't leave it just it's, up it's, to the it's box. It's my job to simplify that based on the platform that the technology is going in. I have right. to write the requirements document that says this is extremely dumb, simple to use, and yeah. beats our competition every time under the target, you know, for yeah. the intended use case. But, but is there a? Do you need a heavy consultative layer in your channel partners and your direct sales force to be able to sort of yes and no? The, the basic value proposition of I can shrink your data so the cost that's of easy, your storage right? goes down. Right. Yeah. That is, that's yeah. easy. But the phone call is I just shrunk my stuff and I did and and and, and I just am undergoing a compliance audit and and, and I can't <laughs> prove or I've got a legal discovery thing going on and I can't prove that this data hasn't been changed hmm. you know, I won't say there's there's <laughs> this, I'm just thinking oh, there's yeah. not unique scenarios but but generally speaking delivering on that basic value proposition is simple to understand it's easy to sell it's easy to establish the ROI by through evaluation yep. tools and and that's the kind of the mainstream model here and and we can simplify these products pretty easily um, now fortunately we now have I mean, we've evolved from a sales perspective, and, and you know maybe this is a you know good way to tie up the conversation here. But but the uh, we have an enterprise class sales force yeah. now uh, on the storage side. Yeah. We have we are now hiring uh, a, a dedicated storage sales team that's going to work with the generalist sales teams yeah. to go not just into existing Dell accounts right. that have bought lots of servers, but into into new accounts that we haven't been able to get into before. And, okay. and so we're seeing a level of sophistication in our go-to-market, in our, in our sales motion, and yeah. our strategies that didn't exist before. And so as we get into these richer, higher intellectual property type products, and that includes Compellent, that includes the files, DSFS file system, that includes the Ocarina capabilities, um, we now have a team that we think it will be successful at taking this to market. Well. Very good. It was great to hear all of that. And I mean, you do so much and there's so much happening in, in, in that side of things. So we appreciate your time. And um, you have anything else? Or? No, this is, all right. I appreciate John. it very much. All right. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Oh, it's a great show so far. The, yeah. it's, you know, the customer attendance is tremendous. And, yeah. and um, there's a lot of interest in, in my products in particular. And, and so it's, it's just a great chance for me to, to okay. engage and ask lots of questions. Awesome. So, I, thanks for your time. I Thank appreciate you. uh, talking to you guys. And, appreciate it. and you know where to find me if you have Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. So we um, next up, we have um, Dan Marbs. He's the AVP of Infrastructure Design at Associated Bank. Come on in. You guys are watching The Cube. Thank you so much for joining us. The Cube is Silicon Angle's flagship broadcast. Silicon Angle is the worldwide leader in tech event coverage. And we also have Dave Vellante here. I'm here from wikibon.org, and uh, and it's good to be here in, in Orlando. And we're, we're here with Dan Marbs, who Callie is a big fan. So uh, yeah, I've been a fan of the show for a long time. Thank Dan you. Dan said, I gotta, nice to meet you. I got to gotta be on with you. Callie. So, Appreciate uh, it. Yeah. You guys switched uh, gears on me over there. We <laughs> so, did. So we Dan, did. Uh, kind of explain what you do, what, what Associated Bank is. And uh, you know just what you guys do over there. Sure, Associated Bank. Uh, we are a, a commercial and personal bank in the Midwest. Uh, okay. We have a three-state footprint. We're in Wisconsin and Illinois and Minnesota. Okay. Uh, we provide full-service banking for for all of our clients. So loans, mortgages, and um, the whole financial services okay, package. Cool. Um, I am a systems engineer. I work on our design team. I, I function really as our lead uh, server and storage designer. Um, so we are we are here um, sort of giving the good word about Compellent. We've been a Compellent okay. customer for a little over five years um, from uh, taking our journey with them since they were fairly small and mm. uh, we we feel like we've grown up with them in the storage space. So we're, uh, we're just here telling our story this year. So was it an awkward transition as Compellent got bought? Uh, no, we were we were excited to see all of the new opportunities with the Dell family that would be uh, would be opened to yeah. the Compellent product line. A little bit scared because we've seen other acquisitions in the past, <laughs> yeah. not, not necessarily by Dell, but usually uh, the whole acquisition process is a very mm -hmm. scary thing for well, everyone right. on the well, other side. You're always you're always worried that the the organization doing uh, the, the purchase mm -hmm. of the smart company is going to take them and, and tear them apart and and ruin the fabric of what it was that made the company so successful. And with Compellent, there's really a whole 
whole culture surrounding the company. I mean, that they're really a small shop, able to be very agile and very mobile um, because of their, their small size. That's awesome. And just a great culture of people that they developed. So, so take us back to, you said five years, you've been working with Compel. Take yeah. us back five years ago. What was the world like and what were the drivers um, to move in that we were, uh, we were using primarily DAS five years ago. Uh, and we knew that after one of the, our recent acquisitions, um, that we needed to provide some more centralized storage, primarily for document archiving, all of our old uh, green screen reports and the signature cards and all those sorts of documents. Um, so we know we needed some sort of SAN solution uh, because we were just scaling out faster than, um, than DAS was really gonna allow us to uh, keep going. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had looked at a couple of vendors, um, the, uh, company that we purchased had some existing SAN storage and that vendor um, was really more aimed at really massive million dollar plus enterprise deployments and we just weren't really ready for that at that point. Um, so we um, actually at the end got down to considering the Equalogic solution and uh, the Compellent solution um, and we ended up going with the Compellent solution. Okay. So we started out small, our original deployment was about 17 terabytes. Um, and over that five years, we've grown from one array with that small amount of storage to eight production arrays with about 900 terabytes in total. Uh, Did you wow. What? Do you have to have people? Did you add people to manage that? Or yeah. We are, at this point, we have four engineers who uh, take part in both the SAN design and administration activities. But um, in our time estimates for the last month, we figured it, it's a one-tenth of one FTE total. Uh, across all systems for all design and administration tasks. Time and that was... Thing. Yeah, it was, we, there were like 26 hours of time logged in the last month for set administration. So okay. it, it really does run itself. I mean, I hear these horror stories about people saying they've got spreadsheets of data to manage where this block is, and that's, that's ah. insane. <laughs> so we just let the system basically run itself, and we learned long ago, don't try to outsmart the hardware. Just let it do its thing, and if somebody needs more space, we can click, 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 and it's done. Your background so, is not loan management? Uh, no, my I is that actually, what? Lund management. Oh. No, my background <laughs> Volume management. is actually education. I have a undergraduate degree in music education. I was a high school band director for really? uh, five years before becoming a touring performer, which was the last time I was in Orlando, and uh, hmm. now I work in IT. Wow. Kelly was like a junior high school band director yesterday at uh, Downtown Disney. Maybe an elementary oh, school it? band director. Nice. We, just, we were doing that. Oh, dance, yeah. No, I was doing the chicken dance. Kids. That's kind of what you did. I don't know if I was directing <laughs> rather than I was trying to follow along. Oh, I thought they were mimicking you. <laughs> yeah, no. With junior high students, that is often the best strategy. Yes. <laughs> Try not to get trampled. <laughs> so uh, just to veer off course here a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you said last time you were here in Orlando. Yeah. How Are you still That was the performing? summer of, uh, I perform a lot now, just not with that show. Um, in the summer of 2002, I was selected to be part of the initial touring cast for uh, an offshoot of the show Blast called Shockwave, and we performed for three months on the American Adventure stage at Epcot, uh, and then nice. did a seven-month U.S. tour. Wow, and that's then, a long time to yes. be on the road. And then after that, the, the show went to London, and I ended up going back into uh, into education, and then eventually transitioned into IT. Wow, mm -hmm. what a life you've had. It's, <laughs> So to go back to you know the the move to Compellent when you guys decided mm -hmm. uh, was you said it was really easy obviously but were there any you know sticking points was was there any tough part to that transition not to that transition um, we've had a few bumps in the road along the way we figured out at one point we had tried to take those original rays that we had and just make them scale up to be very 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 large I mean. At one point, I think the initial arrays we had, we built them up to about 160 or 170 terabytes each. Yeah. And the problem is, it's great to have all your eggs in one basket because it's just there, but when the bottom breaks out of the basket, it's it's problematic. And and we fell into a trap where I think a lot of people do, only considering, you know, I have X amount of gigabytes available and I have X amount of gigabytes of data. Mm -hmm. This one is less than this one, so I'm good, without considering the impact of the performance uh, on those... Uh, of those different workloads. we In 2007, yeah. we switched away from tape and we went to all disk to disk backup. Um, and, and even from a, a data recovery standpoint, having your backup data on the same spindles as your production data is really stupid. Um, <laughs> because if you have yeah. some sort of data center failure, you've lost everything. Sure. So we've we've adopted, you know, I think in, in the computing world in general, we've realized we can't, even with processors, we can't continue to scale up and scale up and scale up. So now we scale out. So okay. that's why at this point we have uh, four production arrays in each of our data. Okay. How do you do your backups? What, what's uh, um, you a snapshot or? Uh, we actually are using a disk-to-disk -disk backup third-party product at this point um, for some of our very largest systems, like our document archiving system, which is currently 
uh, around 17 terabytes of live production data. We actually use snapshots and then replicate that offsite to our other. To What's the your backup software? Uh, we're using uh, a product called Evolt right now uh, right. by i365. Uh -huh. You know Evo and like it? Uh, Evolt, I know a little bit. I know i365 a bit. I mean, it's it's sort of an emerging, you know, mm -hmm. category of software, right? If it's not the classic uh, yeah. Symantec, Tivoli, right? <laughs> uh, Legato based, right? So mm -hmm. I, yeah, I like it. You okay. Know, I think it's. Uh, I mean, for disk to disk, right? I mean, that's the mm -hmm. that's the feature. You know, no tape. Uh, we we only use tapes uh, for our core IBM hardware right now, which was out of scope at the time that we initially implemented that solution. But for all our, we're primarily a Windows shop. Uh, for all of our Windows boxes, the uh, backups are all disk, uh, all tapeless. And you're doing virtualization, server virtualization. Yeah, using we are. Um, or VMware. Or? Uh, we are using both. Uh, in the data centers, we're primarily using VMware's ESX 40 and 41. Uh, we are probably 70% virtualized in the data center at this okay. point. Um, we still have a significant physical hardware footprint because we have approximately 300 remote locations, uh, branch offices and, and uh, brick and mortar back office locations. And it's without fully revamping your infrastructure and going with VDIs and thinking about converging all your data inside the data centers, um, there's really just a need for a physical server in talk those about, locations. Talk about the bank. What's happening at the bank, at the business, and what is that? Been talking about different for, industries. For yeah. IT, what is, what is that? Um, what's happening? What does it mean for well, you? Well, we just we're really trying to provide uh, service to the customer and give them all the channels that they want. Uh, this past weekend, we just launched a major revision to our online banking platform, and we now have a mobile banking platform. So as as people begin to use their tablets and their smartphones as really their primary interface device to the internet, uh, we want them to be able to have their banking you know, activities be able to work on those devices. So you can get your balances, you can transfer funds mm -hmm. and do it all from your phone. Yeah, that's been you know a huge mm -hmm. thing on, on, on the consumer and to mm -hmm. use the phone for banking. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been interesting to watch as, as those changes happen. So, so do you see that going anywhere different than it is now? I think as, as we, as that platform as a smartphone and tablet platform becomes more capable and has more ability. Mm -hmm. I know there are banks right now experimenting with take a picture of a check and submit that through your mobile banking platform yeah, I think and actually deposit that to your account. We won't mention them, sorry. Right. <laughs> the bank which must not be named. Um, right. You know, we, we will continue to see what uh, what our partners, um, you know, our third party providers uh, are able to leverage uh, okay you know as, as those platforms develop How about this idea of an app store for the enterprise is that something that your industry you think will hmm. will get to or your organization at the point where we're I think fully ready to embrace tablets and smartphones and we really understand the different work types uh, that occur because you think about a, a loan origination officer versus a teller versus a traveling salesperson versus a traveling IT person and Every one of those people interfaces with the network and with the data differently. So what we really need to do is, is continue to be cognizant of what those roles are okay. and uh, adjust their interface to fit. So if that's a tablet or a smartphone with an app store, great. If that's a, a laptop with a Citrix application portal, great. If it's a fat desktop, great. You know, we want to... We, we want to let the business drive the technology decision so we can provide the right solutions to those folks rather than simply trying to shoehorn technology into that we think is cool into a place where it might not be needed. And we were talking off camera, sure. you're doing some desktop virtualization, but it hasn't really hit the whole yeah, it's, mobile it's a, space yet. It's a pilot project at this point. What we, we're looking at uh, was if you have a large back office location that becomes unusable, tornado, fire, flood, mm -hmm. Godzilla, you know, what have you, um, we want, we need some way to uh, allow those users to be functional in, in as short a time as possible. So we've taken some unused space in uh, some of our current locations and put a number of thin clients out there and we're leveraging uh, VDIs right now for workspace recovery um, and business resumption for, for those folks. Okay. So, um, so it really hasn't hit the mobile side of your business yet? Not yet. Mm -mm. Yeah. Do, you, do you expect that, that VDI, and desktop virtualization, why do you even call it desktop virtualization anymore, right? I mean, we've got all these devices. You think that... Because uh, virtualization's a buzzword and people like buzzwords. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so speaking of buzzwords, so you do, you do server virtualization mm -hmm. um, and you use some VMware. Yes. Um, and, and the VDI is VMware as well? Or? Yes, it's, uh, it's on VMware right now, uh, fronted by Citrix. Uh, okay. Hmm. So both. Mm -hmm. How do you do disaster recovery? Very carefully. 
Um, we actually, for a lot of our critical applications, we leverage uh, some of the asynchronous replication features in the component product. Our document archiving system, for example, um, we have, I believe, nine or ten virtual servers and a two-node cluster um, that backends the database and all the file share data, and that entire infrastructure lifts up, um, replicates over to the other data center, and uh, can be presented on other hardware in the opposite data center. And, and we take advantage of some network tricks with stretch VLANs and yeah. um, that sort of thing. So you can bring the same servers up in another building on the same IP address. So to the client, nothing has changed. Okay. They, they access the application. Their, their client that they have on their workstation uh, interfaces with the backend components in exactly the same way. And many times they're not even aware it's moved. And we can move that entire application, which is close to 20 terabytes of data in under two hours. So you said that's a, an active-active? Yes. Arrangement, but, uh, but you said it's, it's asynchronous before, not... Uh, um, we don't... We don't have fiber between the two sites, so we don't have low enough latency to do synchronous replication. Okay, so how do you deal with RPO? Uh, we take snapshots of that application every 15 minutes gotcha. um, and replicate those across. And they sync um, relatively quickly. It's just with the mechanics of synchronous replication, it would put an undue burden on the, uh, on the time to complete a transaction. So, we just so you don't have a zero RPO it's as close to zero as we can get. Um, with our core transaction processing system on the IBM hardware, we use their uh, their Mimix replication product, which is transaction-based replication. Um, and with some of our larger SQL databases, we we do database mirroring between uh, between sites because that gets us a lot closer to zero uh, zero RPO. Right. Okay. And um, and do you see do you see that business requirement shrinking or? Is 15 minutes okay for the business, or are they saying? Yeah. It really depends on, on the classification of the application. I mean, we have some which are really like our core transaction processing systems. You can't lose anything ever. So what right. do you do there? Uh, that's on the IBM hardware that's using the Mimix replication, which is um. transaction-based replication. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's essentially as mm -hmm. close to zero RPO as, as you can get. As you can get. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you said you're um, here to share at the forum, to yeah. share your story, to interact with people and um, other customers, I guess, right? Yes. How's that going? Have you uh, met anybody really interesting? Uh, we've done a lot of uh, chatting with analysts and, and media folks over the last couple of days. Um, I think that this conference is really interesting. I think you have people who are from the Equalogic camp that are apprehensive and excited all at the same time about Compellent, and you have people mm. from the Compellent camp who are excited and apprehensive all at the same time okay. about what does the what does the, the merger into Dell bring and how do right. these partnerships affect the product so um, our experience has been that you know all of these players in the space that we've worked with generally have the customers yeah. best interest in mind and, and we believe that um, now with compellent being part of this larger family that it's going to open even more doors okay. you know, it reminds so, me we have to, uh, to digress we have dear friends <laughs> who live in England all we have is probably seen in the close to 10 years they're coming over this year and we're going to rent a house down on the beach with our kids and our kids have all grown up I'm now. jealous right so but it's like the f two families getting together the, mm -hmm. the parents all know each other but the kids you know it's like yeah an ecologic, what's going on here and that's a good analogy there good. I have no <laughs> doubt it'll all be good but, um, yeah so um, what about compellent let's talk a little bit more about them because I've talked to a lot of compellent customers and, and actually you guys are kind of boring. Like the stuff doesn't break. It's just you set it and forget it. I mean, what doesn't Compellent do well that you wished it did well? Yeah, I really can't think of anything. I, I answer every what, what is up with that? I don't know. It, it's um, <laughs> part part of the advantage that we have, having been a customer for so long, is that uh, I have really good relationship with a lot of the senior engineers and senior support people. Um, so even when it's a, a feature request, um, matter of fact, I just spent some time talking with one of the directors of technical engineering today, and I was like, you know, it'd be great if, if you replay manage your product, which is their um, their VSS uh, yeah. snapshot engine, if it did, if it just did this, you know, your your power, all your PowerShell integration, if you could just add commandlets for these two little things, and it's like, okay, cool. yeah, that was it. I'll probably have them in less than a month. Wow. Yeah. And you're like, oh. I'm like, yeah, this didn't work exactly. I said, okay, sure, I'll fix it. Do you, Do you see that changing? I really don't, because I, I, I really think, I mean, I, I continue to be struck in both meeting and listening to Michael Dell and just how he really seems to understand the human aspect of this business. Yeah. And we talked about Dell, the Dell Salesforce becoming trusted advisors mm -hmm. um, and really building long-term relationships. And I think that he just talked about really looking at and embracing the co-pilot support model um, 
and just understanding what that culture is all about. And, and we're we're really good friends with um, with the president, with Phil Soren, the president of Compellent. Yeah. and he's really confident that you know that culture is going to be able to stay in place, and it's it's just going to build. I mean, they're adding all sorts of staff, but I know they're hiring the right people that are you know going to keep that that same culture alive. Yeah, Phil's great. He's been on the Cube a couple times. Yep. Mm-hmm. He's been Yesterday on twice. and today twice. here. Funny guy. <laughs> this week we had him on a VMware a couple times, and uh, you hear the same theme of compelling customers. Yeah. We had Heineken on at, uh, at VMworld, and absolutely love it. And, and it's just a, it's, it's hard to believe thing. almost, yeah, you know? It is hard to believe, right? Because it's, it's IT, <laughs> right? There's usually right. something. Like, <laughs> All right, let me tell you the inside baseball on that. But um, yeah, and I think so. some of the frustration that, that generally we as technologists have with with our technology providers is that we, we understand that not everything is going to work 100 percent right 100 percent of the of time. But when you get I, there's another vendor that I work with that I it took me six months to resolve a what I consider to be a fairly basic support slash design issue. Okay. Um, with Compellent, I, I've never had to wait more than a couple of days for RCAs. Hmm. Um, they'll escalate it up to the highest levels of engineering, and they will get you the answers you need. And if you're actually in, if you're in a jam where something hasn't worked right and it happens to be service affecting, it's they will get all hands on deck and fix it as fast as humanly possible. You know, it's interesting when, when it's we impressive. started Wikibon. My colleague David Floor and I, we did a lot of. He did. He's a CTO. Did a lot of technical analysis, and we we looked at all the various suppliers and we asked each of them can you give us you know examples of what, what we call the hero report you know what I'm talking about no I don't so the hero report is and, and I don't, I'm curious as to whether or not you use it it shows you what your utilization is you know like, uh, allocated versus written you know all this, essentially all the money you're saving is, you know um, do you do you see those statistics do you use those statistics uh, do you report on we, that or? we don't really consider those I mean we we, I think we have a rough idea of what those numbers are, but we don't we don't track them to the penny the way some other organizations do. We'd just <laughs> rather spend the time, you know, implement, you know, continuing to improve our design, implementing better solutions, and I mean, we can draw them up if we need to. But. Well, the reason I brought it up is because um, Compellent was really one of the few companies that said, "Oh yeah, we have that." We pushed a button and got it, hmm. and essentially they took metadata in from from. You know all their customers. It wasn't customer data; it was mm-hmm. metadata about you know how the system was behaving, and they just shared it with us. Mm-hmm. Here it is, and we were able to run a statistical sample on on the efficiency of the products relative to you know traditional arrays. Mm-hmm. But you couldn't get that type of reporting out of the other systems, and it struck us that wow, the reason is because it's so simple, mm-hmm. uh, fundamentally. Simple. And, and there were some others too that, that mm-hmm. did it, but it was sort of the modern architectures. The Compellent three par was another one that was really good at that, um, but some of the other stuff wasn't. So. It sort of underscores that whole trend. I mean, Callie and I were talking before this event. Our, the IT at our, our, our home is better than the IT at our work yeah. these days. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's, you know, you were asking earlier uh, of, of And by better, do you mean easier? Yes. I mean, right. better experience is right. what I mean. And, you know, as an IT person, you, got, you might ruffle some feathers saying that, but the reality yeah. is, is, you know, it's pretty easy to run IT at home. you got your Gmail, you got your phones, and it's, mm-hmm. there's some complexity. But you were asking, Kelly, you know, is that is that relatively new? Compellent is one of those companies mm-hmm. that I think catalyzed that whole that whole shift to the, the consumerization of IT. Do you yeah. see that, you know, driving into other parts of your business? Or? I think that if you really look at what it means to embrace the concept of private cloud, yeah, I, I think Compellent will be a facilitator for us as we as we really put the rest of the pieces in place with their storage and, and virtualization, and then all the process shift that has to happen to really embrace private cloud. So, so private cloud, is that something you guys think about that's a term you use um, I, internally? We haven't, we don't use the term internally as such, but we, there are a lot of things we do that align with what people traditionally believe private cloud to be. What, what makes your private cloud, let's call it that, what makes it cloud? Um, we are trying to, as much as possible, automate away the minutia of system provisioning and system re- and, and capacity addition, mm-hmm. you know that's the, we really want the brain resources that we hire. We, you know, we hire people because they're smart and they're good at what they do, and we want them to be able to use those traits, sure. those assets in in the most effective way, which is not click provision, click provision, click. You know, just <laughs> make make the make the busy work go away. Yeah. And let, yeah. yeah, and let people think about really what can we do to help drive business initiatives like what what systems can we put in play like what high level integration can we do that's going to make all of this make more sense to our customers it, as IT our customers are both 
all of the tellers and the other frontline employees, and then obviously the customers of the bank. So you're yeah. talking about integration with your financial systems and the business systems that, right. that, that, that matter and drive yeah. value. Mm, exactly. How about, um, so there's a lot of customers out there that, you know, they might be using legacy systems, they might be using DAS. Um, what advice would you give to those individuals that are thinking about maybe moving toward a more virtualized storage environment, virtualized sand right. environment? I think, you know, t going, back in time and and if i could if i could give myself that same advice i would say understand what you want the system to do and how you perceive that it may grow i mean everyone talks about this massive growth of data and now it's you know, hundreds of percent every year and you just have to really understand what that's going to be and, and how you're going to use the system we we now understand that we have to monitor both raw capacity and then the overall performance characteristics of the data and the systems that yeah. we're, we're integrating and and that's where we failed early in, in 2007 and 2008 and got ourselves into a bit of a jam. Hmm. So have a vision, have a, have a strategic direction, and it, it's a lot easier to put technology into a plan than to make a plan after you've already decided on, on random bits sure. of technology. Like, let the business drivers determine the technology you're going to use rather than forcing technology to drive business strategy because that leaves nowhere good. Yeah. That's a good thought to end on. We really appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much. Um, all right. You have anything else before no, Dan, he leaves? I just wanted to, to make sure to I didn't cut uh, you off. Fantastic background. I, I yes, love the story. Very interesting stuff. So uh, we'll have this up live. I mean, this is live now. We'll have it up uh, on demand on siliconangle.tv. Yep. So, fantastic. So oh, go do in. Do you have a Twitter a ID? I do. It's uh, at Dan Marbs. Okay. M A R B E S. Yes. Correct? Yes. All right. Well, tweet me and uh, we'll try and. Uh, talk a little bit later. All right. That Thank you fantastic. so much for watching. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Great to meet you. All right. This All is right. Uh, Silicon Angle TV's continuous coverage of the Dell Storage Forum. Uh, we are here live at the Cube, our flagship product, uh, the Silicon Angle, the worldwide leader in tech coverage, tech event coverage. I'm Dave Vellante with Wikibon.org, and I am here with my co-host. Callie Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and um, actually, so we are going to break right now, and we want to play a, um, uh, an interview that we had with Phil Soren before, yesterday, actually. You saw that one? I did. I saw the, the Phil Soren uh, interview yesterday and part of today. But, awesome. Uh, so, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow. So, let's go. All right, well, let's cut to that. Take a look at Phil. We'll, we'll, we'll see what he's got to say. So he was <laughs> just up. He's up. He's over there looking at us now. So maybe we I can, think he knows he's maybe, coming. Maybe so for those of you up. just joining us, this we are at the Dell Storage Forum. This is John MacArthur, and we are about to bring. We'll, we'll, we'll see what he's got to say. So he was <laughs> just up. He's up. He's over there looking at us now. So maybe we I can, think he knows he's maybe, coming. Maybe so for those of you up. just joining us, this we are at the Dell Storage Forum. This is John MacArthur. And we are about to bring on Phil Soren. He's the president of Dell Compellent. So come on over, Phil. Yeah, Phil, great to have you here. I'm really glad you, I'm really glad you can We've make it. This is, this is We've been talking you up. Yeah, we have. Uh-oh. So, well, <laughs> what'd you say? I gotta find this out here. You just this got out from fun. a keynote. Do you get paid to do this? I, <laughs> Oh, this is free, you know. We get paid we, we in cookies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll be good here. So how's it going? Going great. Did you enjoy great. The, the keynotes and everything? Yeah, well, we, you guys we were, were doing here. Yeah. We were here, so we want to know what you said. We want to know what you said. Uh, yeah, we talked. Uh, actually, it was kind of a fun event here. We uh, First of all, I got to thank some of our customers that uh, have been with us for 10 years and oh, some okay. of the business partners who bet okay. their business uh, on us. And it, not quite 10 years, but yeah, that, well. that, that, that was really impressive. And actually, one of our business partners got up and thanked us at the end. That was real neat. Oh, uh, wow. Actually, kind of emotional for me. But uh, they, uh, I'll tell you what, kind of what I tried to talk about is how we innovated a compellent. Yeah. And how we're going to keep innovating uh, under Dell and not lose that innovation, which is hard. You know, you got to when you're smaller, it's easier to innovate. So how do you keep that going? And, and uh, how do you? I, yeah, well, well I'll tell you <laughs> one of the biggest things we did at Compellent was uh, we formed a thing called the C3, the Compellent Customer Council. Right. And we formed it before we had a product. Yeah, and, I, uh, I actually came to one you of your came, first. You came. You spoke to one. I spoke That's to right. one of your first. I was, the second second meeting. I we came had, to the second came, one. Yeah. You didn't invite me to the first, but I got to the oh, second. Oh, Alex. We had a good. We had a good. I hear a little bitterness there. It was good. 
And it's, uh, so it was really neat because uh, well, when we started the company, we got a lot of press and coverage. And so a lot of people called and said, we want to know what you're doing and we'd like to participate with you and help you. And, and so what we said is, um, you know, first we said, we're in stealth mode. We can't tell you it's a secret. <laughs> and, and then you can go, this is stupid. We're going to want to talk to these same customers a year from now. Right. Let's bring them in and uh, build the product together. And so we actually brought them in. And, you know, I talked about uh, Marty Sanders ran that first one and he, um, you opened up a rack and it was empty. He said, this is our product. What do you, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> and uh, we got a lot of sighs and yawns in the audience, but uh, they hope they helped us fill up the rack. And okay. so we want to continue that. And, and I also kind of talked about the innovation that's kind of occurred in the last decade in storage. Uh, you know, you've been a storage veteran too, but uh, I think yeah. I've been in 25 years or, or a little more. Yeah. I started when I was 12, but uh, <laughs> they, um, the storage really, the innovation has been very, very uh, quick this last decade. And you know, I kind of talked about that... Um, uh, I kind of talked about if you look at the innovation, it hasn't come from the big legacy vendors. It's come from the innovators that like Compellent and Ecologic. And I kind of did a little a joke I've learned in Texas that the uh, the legacy vendors kind of have big hats but no cattle. You know, that's a. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, from it, Texas. It, you know. oh, I'm insulting you now, right? So, <laughs> hey, so that's kind of what we talked about. Yeah. Now. Okay. Okay. So, you know, how, how are you going to continue that innovation then? Well, the biggest thing, like right here, we're starting. We got uh, we got breakout sessions with customers, getting the feedback, what we're doing. We're opening up, kind of what we're going to do development wise, to see if that's the right stuff they want to see. Uh, we'll continue, like on Sunday, we had our partner advisory council, which is our come our key resellers, mm -hmm. and they are right there with us, giving us a lot of feedback on the integration of the two channel programs. What are they telling and, you? Because uh, you, you you were both pretty uh, of an Ecologic and and, and compelling, very channel friendly. Yeah. Right. Well, so, they, they gave us a lot of feedback on deal registration and conflicts yeah, and yeah, okay. how to work with the Dell sales Don't take force it direct. And, and, uh, <laughs> you know, those, <laughs> yeah, work, work with us a little bit there. Yeah. <laughs> but they, um, it's, I'll, I'm really glad Equalogic was first because they broke the ground with Dell on the channel yeah. front. And uh, we've been able to kind of piggyback on that. And they've been, you know, things like, uh, you know, how we do deal registration. We, they've taken some of our program elements and incorporating the Dell ones. They've yeah. been, okay. they're, they're open more, more than just technology, what they're uh, taking from Compellent. So yeah. Copilot is another big one they're, they're adopting that concept. Yeah, tell me about Copilot, because Copilot was, uh, you mentioned Copilot at the time of the, uh, either at the IPO or the acquisition. I oh, think it was absolutely. at the IPO you talked about co yeah. Copilot. So, so tell me about Copilot. Well, so everyone has to have support. And uh, with Copilot, what we do is we try to take it to a whole new level. And we named it different because it is different. Uh, so we call it Copilot because we want that customer to know that when they call into our support line, that uh, that person is in the cockpit with them as opposed to a control tower where they're kind of ordering them around. They're in the cockpit, and if they don't land, they, they both don't land. Okay. So that's the concept. But it's uh, it incorporates a lot of software. We do a lot of real sophisticated call home. And then we use that data once we get that call home data to predict and prevent uh, problems for customers. And then uh, we have a you know, just a whole concept. We don't believe in callbacks. The person on the, the phone, the first person they talk to is going to be very technical. It's going to okay. be able to answer questions. We encourage how to, you know, how do I do questions as opposed to I'm broke and uh, you know, the way you do it. And, and then also we follow up. We help, you know, we call them when they don't have a problem just to see how things are going. So it's just a lot of things, but ultimately it's people. And we okay. just got the best best people in the world actually working it. And That's always going to try to incorporate thing. that in other products. Yeah. That's a good thing to focus on is the, is the people. Yeah. Let's talk about fluid data for a moment. Mm -hmm. I'd kind of like to hear your thoughts on that and where you think it is and where it's going. Yeah, it, what, what, what it uh, you, you hit it right in the nose there, which is it's got so much possibility. So it's uh, we're not done with it. But yeah. uh, those another one compelling did kind of coin the term fluid data, and it just kind of it described our whole product. You know, it described how we manage data, get the right data at the right you know uh, disk drive at the right time at the right price, and we do it automatically and very fluidly. I mean, it, it just described what we do. It described our support. It described our hardware architecture where they can uh, you know, fluidly move with new technology without having to start over or throw things away. So we have this persistent architecture. Okay. And then uh, when Dell acquired us, they started looking at their product portfolio and they go, you know what? A lot of this fits in there. You know, uh, Equalogic doesn't have um, forklift upgrades either. It fit right in there. They manage data real fluidly and dynamically. They have the peer scaling, so it fit there also. Uh, it managed some of the, the things we're going to do with the, uh, you know, the fluid file system that they have. It just, I don't know, it, so I know you're, it describes what we do. You're, you're, you're running right now, you're running Equalogic as, uh, so, so you're running Compellent as a separate sort of group within the uh, server storage. 
division. Is that right? Yeah, we're working. You know, we're pretty key to Dell's future. So it's a very integrated effort. Now, Compellent right now is, you know, in, in Minnesota. They're investing in Minnesota. We'll add hundreds of jobs up there. Already have yeah. added hundreds that we're doing there. Um, the development team, the, the Compellent development team is working on the Compellent product. But there's also a portion of it that's working on integrating these other technologies, mm -hmm. too, like the scalable file system. Okay. And the, that's from, you know, the X, from X and X. Yep. And then yeah. the, uh, you know, uh, compression and deduplication technology. From the Ocarina, top acquisition. Of so there's, um, it's separate, but it's pretty integrated, frankly, though, too, in the in the day-to-day -day efforts. Okay. So you don't really see, you know, Dell teaching Compellent or Compellent teaching Dell one way or the other. You really see your, yourselves as teams. It, 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 it really is that way. Um, I thought, you know, frankly, engineering would be one of the tougher ones to, yeah. you know, we got our way, you got your way. Uh, but that that's actually <laughs> gone really smoothly. Good. They, they've met, they've kind of quickly... Uh, got respect. Uh, one thing that was really good too, that Dell, uh, Dell has a lot more technical talent than they might have had years ago. And so that when these engineers see technically competent people to work with, they, res they get respect and then they work yeah. together and that, that's happened. So yeah, engineers, it's not a, our way or their way. Right. But, uh, engineers usually get along pretty well. It's just the next level up is where fights start to, start to <laughs> <laughs> So I'm the fighter then. Right? Well, I guess well, apparently, not. Moment, apparently yeah. not. Apparently yeah. you're getting along or you're playing well with others. Right. So that's good. Mom taught you well. That's a Catholic, that's from, Catholic yeah. school education, yeah. I guess. That's <laughs> a Catholic school and you were a teacher too, right? I was, I was a school teacher. Yeah. Math? Junior high math teacher, yeah, yeah. Way wow. back when, yeah. So, so why the move, and did that teach you anything coming from those roots? Uh, it taught me a lot, <laughs> there. Uh, how to handle injuries like handling junior high math. No, oh. that's, that's, that's <laughs> bad. don't don't put that one on. That's too late, it's man. Live. <laughs> it's live. It's live. Okay. Uh, no, it, it uh, yeah, teaching does teach you a lot. How to be dynamic and fluid. You got to yeah. do that if you're a junior high math teacher. Definitely. And you know, it, it's a lot of it's presenting and being on your feet and being able to yeah. adjust. So, yeah. Yeah. Good background. And this has paid off well for you. This is your second storage company, yeah. this, right? This paid a little better than uh, school teaching did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The second we did, uh, the three of us founded another company in 95. It's the same three. The, for same three. Uh, it was uh, uh, that, that company, when, you know, we had the first SAN in the industry in 1995. Right. First virtual SAN, so right. I think we have a lot of innovation. A lot of tight VMware integration, I think, at the time. Uh, I th well, VMware really wasn't kind of going there. But, it, but how we virtualized up. all the physical drives yes, is yeah, really the, yeah. in, a lot of the innovation. And uh, yeah, VMware, Actually, you can't look no, at it. VMware has kind of done what we did the storage early on, and now yeah. you know, we're, we're expanding on that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, we know we have to let you go because you have a very busy schedule. I really appreciate you oh, stopping you. by, and it was great to chat with you. Well, this is fun here. So who do you got next? Darren. Oh, we're going to we're gonna, okay. we're gonna talk to your classmate, Darren. Okay, we'll see, <laughs> see, we'll see <laughs> we get along well together. Get along, right? Darren. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank well, you thank so you much, guys. Phil. Right. It's fun to have you guys here, and thanks for supporting. Thank, thanks oh, for coming. Right. All right. Thanks, thanks, good to see you. Bye-bye. Take care. So next up is Darren. So thank you. Welcome back. This is live continuing coverage from the Cube at Dell Storage Forum, Forum 2011. I am John MacArthur, and I'm here today with guests from Caringo. We have with us uh, Gene Cheshire. Hi there. Nice to meet you. Thank and you. Mike Melson. Correct. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. So how's the show going for you guys? Excellent. It's, it's good been energy. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. You, really good. You, you really got here good. when? I flew in Monday. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I got here Monday evening also. Yeah, just okay. in time for the party. Good. Oh, right. just in time for the party. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so Caringo's in the object store business. That's correct. And uh, and you, what's the what's the heritage of the company? Just give us a little background. Sure, sure. Well, Caringo is founded by three gentlemen who have a tremendous legacy in the startup business. Uh, uh, Mark Gar Goros, uh, Jonathan yeah. Ring, and Paul Carpentier. Yep. The, their names make up the name Caringo. Uh, Paul Carpentier, in particular, is the f uh, the father of CAS. He invented what became the Centera product. Right, right. And I so, knew that there was I knew yes. that there was an EM uh, a Centera relation. There, yeah. there very much right. is. Right. So, uh, he ended up taking uh, the, the things that he wished he had perhaps done differently and uh, went with 2.0, if you will, and uh, uh, parlayed that into the object storage server right. that, that is so one of, Yeah. So one of the things I'm, I'm interested in is uh -huh. what were the things that they learned in generation one uh, sure. to, to sort of impact uh, generation two CAS sure. products? Sure. Uh, one of the things, of course, with Centera, the original uh, addressing scheme was based on the MD5 hash of the content. Right. When MD5 became a cracked algorithm, then that became unsecure. And it was no longer something that held up in, in court of law for a compliance key. 
Uh, you can no longer prove that the content was immutable. They've had to deal with that. So he separated out the address from the ability to prove forever that the content was truly never changed. So that was, that was one thing. The other was dealing with uh, small files. Sintera yeah. has a history of perhaps not being real speedy with the smaller files. So he fixed that with and I, and I, I think product. the way Sentara works, correct me if I'm wrong, you, in order to deal with billions of small files, what they would do then is sort of aggregate groups of files and then deal with them as a single object. Is that right? Yeah, and they keep the index for for the metadata actually in their access nodes in the server so that it's not really stored with the object. So with the with the DX in Dell's implementation of Coringo, they, uh, we actually store the metadata with the object physically down on the disk. Okay, and Gene, you're with Dell. I'm with Dell. And your title is? I'm a storage strategist. I work in our PG product development group and in our advanced engineering, so we were working with the DX product in Coringo before it was released in the early stages of bringing on integration partners and, and kind of bringing the solution to, to market. Okay. Right? Yeah. And, and Mike, were you with Coringo from the beginning? No, I was uh, probably about employee 20. I've been there three and a half years now. Okay. Uh, and the relationship with Dell uh, mm -hmm. started when? Well, our advanced engineering group effectively went out and, and tried to analyze what are the options for this, this type of object storage. We wanted an object storage platform to have a, a, an archive, so it's part of our longer term intelligent data management strategy. So mm -hmm. it ties in with uh, uh, the other acquisitions that we've, we've had recently with Compellent because of their tiering of storage, Ocarina right. because of their compression and dedupe, and Exonet because of the file system. So one of those components of a, of a complete family of intelligent data management product was to have this intelligent active archive and primarily the, the HTTP RESTful interface and the ability to scale to millions of objects. So it was a platform. And we just simply looked at the way Coringo had done it compared to everybody else and said, this is this is what we want. This is effectively the, the way we wanted to implement the technology. So we've become extremely close technology yes, we partners. We're, we really work a lot deeply together. Okay. And you've got a specific device that you ship, right? Uh, uh, but you're also looking, are you looking longer term to embed the functionality into into all of the platform, across all the platforms, or is it going to stay as a separate appliance? All of the above is the proper answer. Okay. Uh, most everything will come to market initially as individual appliances. The archive store, the compression engine, the, the Exonet file head, each of those things will come there. But eventually it's very logical to see uh, the the compression things of Ocarina in, a, in an Equalogic controller to see the file systems and things get more integrated as you go forward. But it's a, it's about collecting the proper intellectual property and applying the right thing at the right place. And, yeah. uh, so there is a, a, a true architecture that Dell is investing in that they call, uh, our new term for it is fluid data architecture. Right. Now that we've uh, got the, the compellent in the family, but it was, a, it was an intelligent data management fabric so that we have the proper relationship of a, of a data mover, of a deduplication engine, of workload managers and so forth so that we break the way that data should be handled down into the smaller components and then apply the technologies to move it more efficiently to where it where it needs to be. So it's a, it's a long road. Uh, and obviously object store is really important in sort of medical records. It's uh, it's it's important in a in a, across all industries in the context of legal and regulatory compliance. Right. Legal and regu regulatory compliance anywhere where there's really fixed content. Coringo was built, uh, Castor, which is the software inside the DX, from the ground up to manage fixed content. Yeah. So, yes, medical images, uh, video, audio, uh, any of those types of things. We're seeing that in media and entertainment, of course. Uh, feature length vi uh, movies now, 12 terabytes of data, 350,000 files. A feature length movies, only 12 terabytes oh, post rendering. <laughs> no, that's the HD raw that mm -hmm. you see in the theaters, 350,000 right. frames. Yeah. Right. After yeah. it's rendered, right. it's right. ready for broadcast, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Pre rendering, it's a lot bigger. Much, than that. much more oh, yeah. than that. So <laughs> the explosion of, of fixed content, if you will, because those frames, once they're shot, they're in the can, they stay, they will edit them and create new versions, new renderings. Right. Uh, but yes, medical imaging, uh, uh, satellite photos, uh, electronic discovery, you know, e-evidence, all of that is just creating tremendous growth of fixed content. And, and, you know, I've talked to banks who said if you could solve the problem of 
uh, and, and I don't know if it, I don't remember if it was Bank of America or one of them, but the problem of, of storing um, you know, um, uh, tens to hundreds of billions of check images. Right, correct, correct. Um, and so I could retrieve a single check image without having to retrieve a bundle of them. Right. Then I'd buy the product today. So how deeply are you guys in that space? A lot. Uh, you know, the, the old traditional problems with checks, uh, uh, different types of bankings would have these millions of little 2K check mm -hmm. images, and they'd be right. laying them down. In is that how small they are? 2K? Yeah, as small as 2K. 2K. And okay. then the smaller sector in a file system is like 4K, so you're wasting 50% right. of the space by right. putting it there. Right. So the way Coringa lays the software down on the DX, they lay the objects down end to end to end. And so there is right. there is no wasted space out there. And okay. it just You can literally, uh, we did a session earlier today where we really got down and did the comparison of traditional file systems versus an archive storage into look at the different efficiencies and right. and you get a when you put an object in an object store you get back a tag or a unique right. unit you get identifier it. and that's, right. that's the way that you find it so it's literally one step to go retrieve that and pull that object back and if you look at a at a file system with a raid five there's I don't know, what was there twelve thousand different pointers get right. hit to pull back one file compared to one so it's those right. those types of efficiencies if you're if you're gonna add ten storage nodes a month for seventy years you got to be sure that you're not wearing out those disk and that you've got a, a pattern of, of accessing that data that will last you through the years and file formats and types and operating systems change but we're a native HTTP so HTTP is probably going to be there a so long that's, time. that's the access method. That's yes. the access HTTP. method. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and is there a theoretical limit um, in terms of the number of objects? Well, mm -hmm. or, or current we can use a class B at network addressing scheme today, so we can logically get about 65,000 nodes and we could store a 30 million items per node depending on their size. So, yeah, so, it's a pretty big number. It's a, pretty, uh, yeah. it's a big number. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the storage capacity as well as the namespacing to address that capacity, all of that is fully d distributed. It's a symmetrical architecture. So... It is hard to predict where that theoretical limit would be with the DX. As you add nodes to the system, it just keeps adding capacity. Is there an operation? Sometimes there's theoretical limits, and then there's the operational logistical limit. You know. Yeah, we like I say, we've looked at scaling uh, in a mid-release in uh, December. We went to the support of Class B versus just Class C networks. But first, you didn't think anybody needed more than like 250 storage nodes. But if you can get to 65,000 storage nodes at yeah. at two terabyte drives, 12 drives per system, you can get to about a, a one and a half uh, exabytes worth of data today. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But we haven't sold one that big yet, but we'd like to. Uh, we'd, be, we'd be pretty happy to find yeah. out what that limit is in reality. Um, so uh, so uh, medical image is big. What about in the area of social media? Because some of these social media platforms, they're sort of, they're building their own I think they're building a lot of their own technology, right? Are That's you correct. seeing opportunities for maybe the tier two-ish kinds of applications, maybe ones Absolutely. that exist in the cloud? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, the first place is uh, CDNs, Content Distribution Networks. Okay. So they have their network where they have a, a tremendous number of edge servers where they cache content as they deliver it, but all of that needs to come back to a, a set of origin servers. For the original content, right. make sure everything's And so for that golden master, which they may want in two or three strategic geographies, mm -hmm. the DX is an absolutely outstanding platform mm -hmm. for that origin server. And those would be server. what kinds of files? Uh, they range in the CDN world everything, from the, the 2K thumbnails for a social networking site to uh, full feature length videos that are streamed across the web. Netflix a customer? No, <laughs> we don't know, okay, I don't know. It seems the like they're soaking up a lot of traffic these yeah, days. So. They are. Well, anything that uh, is native HTTP, so so many things starting out with cameras and PDAs and everything, there's just in an HTML format picture. So, you know, it uh, like one of the big wins for Coringo I know a long time ago they talked about was like Vodafone in Europe. And, and they said, well, they're starting out with HTTP and they're putting it on a file system and they're going across a block system and they're replicating to another file system and then they're delivering HTTP on the back end. So if they could go HTTP end to end from the time you create data until you retrieve data, then you've simplified everything. Every time you go through another format, you have an opportunity to corrupt data or to lose data. So right. it's just a matter of, of having a, a platform. And for all practical purposes, a DX just looks like a like a web server. It's, yeah. it's HTTP 80. It just 
there. Now it just scales and, and it's very easy to manage. You just plug in additional nodes and they boot up and join right. the cluster. And, it right. just, and so there's no there's no backup and restore when you run out of data. You don't have to you know do a forklift upgrade whenever you filled up a frame or something like that. And it, and it fits Dell's model. All of our storage products, we worked for them to be peer scalable. So that's the same way Ecologic, when you add more Ecologic, you get more controllers, more horsepower, more NIC ports, more drive. DX does the same thing. Uh, the way that Exonet scales is the same way. The way Ocarina will scale will be the same way. So as you add more appliances, so to mm -hmm. speak, you will then grow that power you know, as it goes forward. Your, your biggest competitor probably is EMC in this space. Is that right? Or, are there, or, or, is, it, or is it somebody else? Well, we like to think we don't have any competition. Of course, uh, you know, you'd like a simple thing. But MC Centera has gone into life, and that was the probably platform. They have an Atmos out there today. Right. In both cases, they're, they're it's, it's a it's heavy lifting to basically do business with them. They have a very heavy API. You have to like totally rewrite your software to take advantage of it. Or we're really HTTP 1.1, and, and instead of a write, you do a put, and instead of a, a read, you do a get. It's just extremely simple to do that. And so the the porting is, is gives us another set of scale. There's a few others out there, but they're they're making it look like an object uh, uh, where they'll have a file system below, right. or they'll be keeping the index in a server instead of really down with the data. Right. So this is the purest right. application that we've seen in what we truly call a true object store. So we, you would say the wave of the future is accessed by HTTP. That's, that's It absolutely it'll is. It'll be there for yeah. a long time. That was probably the, the last of the major differences that Paul Carpenter looked at mm -hmm. was uh, a protocol as the API, something that was industry standard out there right. that didn't need a big SDK, that you could actually point a web browser at the DX and pull your content out mm -hmm. if you happen to know the, the key. And uh, so it's being validated out there, of course, by some folks like Amazon with S3, you know, that mm -hmm. HTTP is the way to access cloud and object storage. Mm -hmm. You can think of it as a private cloud, but then there's just people are learning different use models. I mean, and it, it was originally thought of very much as being a second or a third tier of storage. But again, in medical, if you're reading 100 meg files, it's, it's primary storage to them. It's Absolutely all they need primary. because yes. of that so you type need some, of application. You need some performance characteristics yeah. that are fairly significant, right? right? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why there are features such as what we call Darkhive, where you have perhaps petabytes of data, but most of it's long tail. It won't be accessed. Medical images right. will sit there. And you need those available. You don't know when the doctor's going to need that x-ray, but when he does, it's got to be there. Yeah. And so we'll fill up DX nodes and then power them down. Mm -hmm. And until the content is needed, those disks will stay spun down. You get 30% power savings mm -hmm. until you need the content, and then it's available almost instantly. Mm -hmm. And again, this relationship has been going on for about how long? Hmm, about probably three years. Yeah, I guess. two, three years. Since okay. the time it started mm -hmm. development. First release was just over a year ago in May. It was the first Dell release of the of the product, and then we had a, a second speed bump that we kind of came out with in the December time frame, and we added some significant features there, where we added the ability to to name an object instead of having to use just that unique unit identifier, okay. so that you can actually. So it's got a worldwide name now. Yeah, so well, you not can a, do that. <laughs> yeah, you uh, can do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so it's. It, it made it more applicable to other areas. We've also come out with a, uh, a file protocol gateway so that you can have a SIFS and an NFS access to it through a gateway. Because some people aren't completely ready to rewrite their software, but they want the advantages of that long-term archive. So we, we developed a gateway that will, you know, would again allow people to do a normal mount. They lose some features when they do that in that if you write native to the application, you can write all your metadata on a per write basis. So I can make five copies of your email and two copies of mine, or I can right. do anything that I want to for life points or when it's going to be deleted. If you do it through a gateway, you have to set your policies on each mount. So a D drive might live for seven years, and an F drive would wind up, you can make it do 19 years or whatever you want. You just set right. your static policies right. compared to them being dynamic. So that's right. about the biggest difference. If I'm an application developer today that's got some sort of long-term where I need immutability. Let's just leave it at that. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm writing a new application. Mm -hmm. um, uh, pretty straightforward. If I right, it so, is. Mm -hmm. uh, you can write standard HTTP calls, but to make it even easier than that, on support.dell.com, there's a complete open-source SDK that sure. has bindings in multiple languages: Java, C#, C++, Python. Mm -hmm. 
you can download that. Literally, you can be writing content into the DX in a matter of minutes. It's, okay, it's but if easy. I was a guy who already developed the application and I, maybe I was integrated with a Centera Atmos kind right. of a, a, mm -hmm. or, or Atmos approach, what's the what's the process for sort of uh, for making a migration or making this an alternative? Right. It's, it's fairly simple, and that was where named objects, as we call them, came in. Originally, when the, the first version of the DX only had the ability to be assigned a key by the DX, you then had to store that in your application. Some applications didn't want that. Right. They said, we create our own name. We even build semantics into the name. It might have an account right. number, that type right. of thing. So now with both naming schemes available, it really is simply a matter of changing your rights to the file system, to mm -hmm. posts, to HTTP, and either storing the key you get back or using the name you've already been using all along. Uh, that it, it really is that straightforward. And so there's and there's a lot of hybrid use cases. So they'll write specific application servers to write all this data, but they may have a simple web browser application for people to pull data. If you want to pull back a map mm -hmm. or a picture, you just type in the HTTP, and you can hide that behind a little plugin to to any type of an app. So the access method. I mean, you can use the SDK and you can write all the things that you need to with the software, but then you can retrieve. It. Very often, when I'm doing a demo, I'll write a script or something and show a bunch of things, and then we'll just type in the an IP address and the URL and boom, here comes that the picture of the Parthenon, whatever you want to see so that you can Which show. Which actually starts bringing some interesting use cases that I don't think you would have ever, ever thought of in the storage world. You can actually post HTML and JavaScript into a DX cluster mm -hmm. and use it as a web server and bring those pages back. Uh, uh, so there are some uh, things like that. You can plug a search appliance into it like you would okay. normally. I was going to ask. Full text index mm -hmm. and okay. metadata index the entire storage system mm -hmm. uh, okay. and then have full text search capability of your entire system. With, with some of the unstructured data, particularly around images and stuff like that, mm -hmm. obviously with images, hopefully there's been some tagging and I can yes. and I can do some searching on that. Are there other capabilities in terms of a search that are sort of interesting to you to enable people to search through things that don't have a lot of metadata, or maybe you use it to create metadata. All of the above. <laughs> Can you talk about it? Can you Absolutely. talk about it? Oh, yeah. Well, let me uh, jump on, on that first, and then Gene, uh, yeah, feel sure. free to chime yeah. in. So in addition to full text search, that type of thing, we also have a product called the Content Router. And you can, when you write data, you can do custom tagging, as you said. Right. So in addition to standard metadata, such as timestamps and those types of things, content length, you can add any custom metadata you want. There's in this uh, product called the Content Router, you can write rules against that metadata to generate lists of content that are in the system that meet criteria, such as tagged as, you know, send to the southwest region, whatever it is. That then is available to get that stream of data and do whatever you want with it. By default, we, si we have a system that will replicate it to other DX clusters anywhere in the world. So uh, that's why it's content replication, the content router. It will route anywhere in the world subsets of the data. But it's an open API, so you can do whatever you, you can dream up with that API as well. Right. In our uh, December release, in our second release, Dell actually created a, a set of standardized metadata tags. And we're encouraging, not completely requiring, but strongly encouraging our ISV partners to write a set of standardized metadata tags down with the object whenever they're creating the object. And this medical, for instance, was a big ask for this. Because they may have five or six applications in a hospital that all need to be archived. Well, the only search was each individual application, so the payroll app versus the pharmacy versus the cardiology each one of them had their individual and they couldn't search across all things but if they get each of those apps to fill the metadata field then they can search and find all of the instances of Mike Melson and, and we can mark him as dead or whatever we need to there in the metadata we can modify we can modify your metadata you know but we can say we Mike found a cure for cancer and we can update that across all of the records. Thank you for going positive. Yeah, there you go. Well, and actually Michael Dell talked a little bit about that in the keynote today is around how the medical community has been in some ways very non-science based and right. so mm -hmm. and some of that's driven by privacy right right because I, I you know I'd like to know how it worked out for you when mm -hmm. you took that medication but mm -hmm. for privacy reasons right. I yeah. I don't get to right so so are you seeing interesting applications some of the most 
the, the, the Very much so. most cutting edge things that I've seen have just come out of conversations with people in the medical because they're usually pretty willing to they write their own software anyway so yes, they're not they scared about mm -hmm. making right. a porter thing and we were in a conversation with a big medical company out on the west coast and they were saying well we can just do HTTP range reads and make it work and I went what explain that well you can read in HTTP a chunk of a file without having to read the whole file from okay. the end so they want to write like 10 copies of the file and retrieve 10 chunks of that file and put them back together so they're retrieving it 10 times faster than they would from a file system for picking it up from the beginning to the right. end. And and we're just going, well, it's just a standard part of HTTP. It just exists out there, but for someone to create that creative application to do that, and they want to see their medical images faster than their competitors. So they're out right. figuring out ways to do that. The other thing they can do, since we have the ability to write multiple copies, the default is like a minimum of two and a maximum of 16, which you can change those things so they want to write like 15 copies of the application or the object when it's first created so that a lot of doctors for the first couple of weeks can get to it and then two weeks later it has a tag that drops it down to two copies for the longer term yeah. retention so that type of metadata manipulation and tagging can be created at the time that the object is written instead of having to be post-process so you mm -hmm. can they'd also possibly have a tag that said delete this file at the end of seven years and so your application doesn't have to go crawl file systems to create deletes. They're just life points that exist. So it's a different kind of tool. Now, Perot Systems has got a lot of expertise in the area of medical. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And so how are you three? You, you, I mean, you're not part of Perot. Perot's part of Dell. But how, how do, does Coringo, Dell proper, and, and Perot System work We're together? very well together. We have a, a, a large, uh, still I think in prototype stage, but it's a large application for Stanford Medical that Perot was involved in supporting out in California, and we actually set up DX clusters with Terra Medica, one of our use partners. Okay. And so Terra Medica performs the, the whole Paxis layer to connect to all the modalities, and then they, as they pool the product in equal logic for their, their almost spooling type of storage, well it has to stay there until it reaches a level of maturity that it's reached the doctors updated at the pharmacy, the different thing, and then it automatically moves through and stored into the DX with the long time archive function. Okay. And then they replicate between their two hospitals so that they've got complete copies of everything with one and the other. And that was was all a Perot integration. Perot did all of the, there's some significant networking can get involved in this. And so yeah. uh, that's where Nero, Perot and the those people do a, do an awesome job because they'll go in and consult and analyze and figure out a person's network so that, uh, that they overcome the fears of, of going yeah. through it. So they've, they've been great partners. And and it's fun because they're they're smart people and they learn fast. And so they, as the more you work with them, they, yeah. they instantly start coming up with new ideas. And, well, I can use this over here. I can use it over there because they see that use case evolving. So. We were talking to some of the Oak Arena team, mm -hmm. and, and when you start thinking about replicating data over distance, and some of this data, is particularly medical right. and entertainment, so some of those files get mighty big Correct. and mm -hmm. could suck up a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so what's the opportunity, but you've got to, if you've got to preserve content in its um, immutable state, Correct. Right? How do you guys work together? What's the opportunity for you guys to work together long term? You know, what can you do? What can't you do? I think it's a tremendous opportunity. When you look at the intelligence of the Oak Arena solution, it really goes about how they do compression and dedupe very, very differently and very, very smartly. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is just a beautiful marriage of two very compatible technologies. Uh, I, I think you heard earlier that uh, Oak Arena and DX are going to be integrated very soon here, mm -hmm. uh, the first to integrate the Oak Arena technology. I think it makes a lot of sense to bring that out first because they add so much value to the immutable story because of the way they do it. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you guys uh, coming on the cube uh, with us. Um, just wanted to see what we've got uh, coming up next. We're going to take a quick break. We're, we're going to take a quick break now, okay. Uh, I'm John MacArthur. I'm here with our guests from Coringo and Dell talking about immutable data uh, on SiliconANGLE, the Cube, uh, the premier <laughs> broadcast, <laughs> broadcast there you go. of uh, tech events worldwide, or at least here in the United States. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. And from now on, you're going to let Kelly do the intros and exits yeah. because she's much better. Thank you. Thank, Thanks, you. Guys. Thank you, John. Right. Yeah. Appreciate your time.